Hi, this is Scott from Church History Matters. As we near the end of this series, we want to hear your questions about Joseph Smith's practice of plural marriage. And who doesn't have questions about plural marriage, right? In two weeks on our final episode of this series, we will be honored to have Dr. Brian Hales with us as a special guest to help us respond to your questions. He's an author and scholar on all things related to Joseph Smith's polygamy, and we've drawn heavily from Dr. Hale's research throughout this series. Let me just say that he is a deep well of knowledge on this topic, so please do yourself and other listeners a favor by submitting your thoughtful questions. You can submit them anytime up to June 22nd, 2023 to podcasts at scripturecentral.org. Let us know your name, where you're from, and try to keep each question as concise as possible when you email them in. That helps out a lot. Okay. Now on to the episode. In June and July of 1843, tensions ran high in the marriage of Joseph and Emma Smith. After she had tried but failed to embrace the principle of plural marriage earlier that May, and after Hiram Smith had tried but failed to convince her of the rightness of plural marriage, even with a copy of Doctrine and Covenants 132 in hand, Records indicate that Emma became, for a time, rebellious, bitter, resentful, and angry. In fact, from July through September of 1843, Emma even became confrontational to Joseph's other wives, trying, sometimes successfully, to drive them away from him. In today's episode of Church History Matters, we dive into the details of this challenging time, as well as the reconciliatory place Joseph and Emma ultimately seem to come to on this. We'll also dig into how Joseph's practice of plural marriage was a major factor behind the conspiracy which ultimately led to his martyrdom. I'm Scott Woodward, and my co-host is Casey Griffiths, and today we dive into our fourth episode in this series dealing with plural marriage. Now let's get into it. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Casey Griffiths. With me is Scott Woodward. Say hi, Scott. Hello. (laughs) And we're continuing our investigation of a challenging subject. That's plural marriage and its origins in the church. So let's recap here really fast. And Scott, we can bounce off each other just to hit the main points. Okay. A person we spent a lot of time talking about last time was John C. Bennett Mm -hmm. and his links or lack of links to plural marriage. Tell us a little bit about him. Recap for us a little bit. Yeah, John C. Bennett, he comes to Nauvoo with an adulterous past. We didn't know about that yet until he starts. I think he was engaged with a young woman or something like that, or at least he was courting a young woman when it was found out that he actually had a wife who had left him because of his adultery, kind of serial adultery. He'd broken up several marriages. Mm -hmm. Joseph confronted him about that. He pledged that he would do better and be better and that he was a changed man. Joseph liked John C. Bennett, and many in Nauvoo did. He was a talented force for good in Nauvoo, uh, helped with the Nauvoo Charter. He was elected mayor at the beginning of 1842. But then his past sins came back with a vengeance, and he begins to not just engage in adultery, but in what he's going to call spiritual wifery. Mm -hmm. And we talked about what that was, this idea that illicit sexual relationships are okay, provided that nobody tells anybody about it, right? As long as there's no accuser, it's not a sin, he taught the women. Mm -hmm. And so when Joseph Smith found out about this, it's going to lead to his excommunication, and he's going to leave Nauvoo angry. He'll publish a bunch of filth against Joseph and the saints. He'll write a book just trying to discredit the saints. He said that Joseph had awakened the wrong passenger in excommunicating him, and so that he was going to make sure the saints suffered and paid for their humiliation of him. So he starts to work outside Nauvoo, stirring up problems, making accusations. Meanwhile, in Nauvoo, there's two people that Joseph Smith is very close to that have varied reactions to plural marriage. We got Hiram Smith, Mm -hmm. who learns about plural marriage from Brigham Young. And then Hiram kind of has to work through his issues, but it seems like Hiram is accepting of it. He eventually practices plural marriage himself. And he, it seems like in the context of section 132, he's trying to help Joseph and Emma find a meeting in the minds, a way that they can resolve their differences over the issue. Yeah, after his conversion to the principal, Hiram becomes like Joseph's biggest supporter, and he's going to be the one that performs a lot of the plural ceilings between Joseph and his later wives. Once he's in, Hiram is in uh, on that principle for sure. 
Yeah, you've got a quote here from Brian Hales. He said, Hiram became Joseph's primary promoter and supporter, performing many of the plural ceilings between Joseph and his later wives. Yeah. So Hiram gets on board. And next, we've got to talk about Emma. And Emma has genuine struggles. We don't have a lot of information from her directly. But we know that Section 132 is received to try and help him understand the principles of plural marriage. Hiram acts as an intermediary. Where does Emma eventually end up with all this, Scott? Yeah, well, it seems like from the existing records that we have that May 1843, right, that was the big month. That was the happiest month perhaps in Joseph Smith's uh, life. Maybe that's overstating it, but certainly in Nauvoo during this challenging time because Hiram comes on board and Emma comes on board to plural marriage. Mm -hmm. She does. She gives her best. She makes a sincere attempt to uh, participate in plural marriage. We don't know exactly what letter to try, but we do know that in May 1843, she's going to give Joseph Smith four wives, the Lawrence sisters and the Partridge sisters, Emily and Eliza Partridge, Maria and Sarah Lawrence. Mm -hmm. One of his wives, Lucy Walker, says that Emma was well aware that he associated with them as wives within the meaning of all that word implies. And that is where it becomes super difficult for Emma. We discussed this, right? Mm -hmm. As she started to actually share her husband physically, even after the very first night Joseph spent with Emily Partridge, Emily says that after that, Emma turned against us. She would never allow us to live with him. She was always kind of paranoid when they were alone together. It just crushed on Emma's tender soul, this idea of sharing Joseph. She tried so hard, but it didn't work. In fact, one observer said during this time that the face of Sister Emma was not a happy one, and her treatment of these plural wives was that of an unhappy, soured, and jealous woman. You can understand the difficulty of sharing your husband, right? This is just so hard. Mm -hmm. So yeah, her acceptance of this was short-lived. So in, in May, May was good, but in June, it starts to wane, right? On June 23rd, Joseph told William Clayton that Emma had treated him coldly and badly and that he knew she was disposed to be revenged on him for something. She thought that if he would indulge himself, she would too. That's caused some interesting speculation. What, what does that mean that she was going to indulge herself since Joseph was indulging himself? And I, I tend to agree with Brian Hales on this, where he argues that Emma wasn't threatening to somehow go live her own version of plural marriage, right, or anything like that, but that she's threatening to divorce Joseph and perhaps remarry or to publicly expose him. Joseph F. Smith said something like that, that Emma said that if he wouldn't give up his plural wives, she would bring him up before the law. So maybe that's what she meant by, I'll indulge myself too. Yeah. Suffice it to say, there's some serious tension that's being built up just a month after she had accepted the principle. There's tension building in the marriage. Yeah. And this is the context where in July 1843, Hiram's trying to intercede. He's trying to help Joseph and Emma come together. Yeah. That's why he asked for the revelation that becomes section 132. And all of these reminiscences, too, we should state are colored by the fact that many of these people that share them, William Clayton, Emily, and Eliza Partridge, are still angry and upset with Emma Smith over her reaction to this. Yeah. So the story is always told that Hiram goes to Joseph and says, if you'll give me the revelation, I can convince any reasonable person of its truth and purity. Yeah. And Joseph says, you don't know Emma as well as I do. William Clayton says, Hiram took the revelation to Emma Hiram came back and said she was very upset, at which point Joseph said, I told you you didn't know Emma as well as I do. Yeah. It's this point that it seems like they have a serious discussion and figure out how to stay together and move forward. Tell us a little bit about Emma's conditions that she sets down there. Yeah. You know, Clayton said that after Section 132, I mean, that backfired big time, right? Yeah. He, the words he used were that she appeared very rebellious. He said she was bitter, full of resentment and anger. So within hours of that episode, we're not talking days, we're talking hours, they sit down and have serious talk, William Clayton recorded, yeah. to negotiate some kind of agreement. And I think last episode, we talked about the first part of that agreement, but not the second. So let's talk about that. So the first part, just to recap, was that they seem to agree that Joseph needs to obtain Emma's permission going forward before marrying any new plural wives, right? If this marriage is going to work, you need to tell me, Joseph, and we need to get permission before marrying any new wives. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll remember that Section 132 instructed Emma to forgive Joseph his transgressions, which, you know, among other things, probably included Joseph 
hurting Emma's feelings by not telling her about some of the plural marriages. Yeah. I know that was complex. It's emotionally complex. It's theologically complex. Uh, Joseph is in some ways is waiting for Emma to have a soft heart about this so he can tell her everything. Mm-hmm. But now, you know, after that kind of spot of sunshine in May, things are getting cloudy again. But it seems to all come out right here. They're really sitting down and saying, are we going to make this work? Yeah, they just sit down and have it out with each other and kind of hash it out together. Right. And you, you feel for both of them, right? And what's interesting historically is after this agreement that Joseph needs to obtain Emma's permission before marrying anyone else, uh, he only marries two more women total. Melissa Lott later on in September of that year, and then Fanny Young in November of that year. Uh, and that's it. And during the last eight months of Joseph's life, he is not going to marry any additional wives. Mm-hmm. Brian Hells suggests that they kind of settle into a kind of monogamy. They, at least they live monogamously together and have you know, a semblance of a monogamous marriage, even though there are these other wives, right? Which I think in another way helps answer the question, why didn't Joseph have children with these other wives? I think the strain that's being placed on their marriage here, like Joseph is just okay to keep the principle the best he can without endangering the marriage with him and Emma. And I think they settle on what appears to be kind of a monogamous way of living, even though there are other women that he's sealed to. And that's really interesting, right? Well, and another wrinkle to that would be he does have one more child, but it's with Emma. Emma is pregnant when Joseph goes to Carthage jail. And Emma's reaction to Joseph Smith's death is just devastating. You know, someone comes to her and says, your suffering will be your crown after Joseph is killed. She turns to them and says, my husband was my crown. So the fact that they're having another baby together, little David Hiram is born after Joseph is killed, and that she's so devastated when Joseph is finally martyred, suggests that they do reach a point of reconciliation. They might not have ever agreed on plural marriage, but their marriage was in a good place when Joseph goes to Carthage. Yeah, I think that's fair. But Emma's concerns weren't just sharing her husband. Her second term of negotiation had to do with her own well-being. And this frames a lot of concern over Emma's financial status, how she's going to provide for herself, how she's going to provide for her kid. Not only is a factor here, but in her later dealings with Brigham Young and the Twelve when they take over leadership of the church. So tell us a little bit about the second demand here. Yeah, so the second demand or or agreement that they reach is that to financially provide for Emma and to assure that if anything ever happened to Joseph or to their marriage, that Emma would be able to provide for herself and children. You know, so if Joseph has many wives, with every wife that he takes, each of those wives could have legal claim upon Joseph's estate in the event of his death, right? Which would leave Emma with little or nothing. Yeah. And so only hours after Emma had rejected DNC 132, William Clayton recorded that Joseph told me to deed all the unencumbered lots to Emma and the children. He appears much troubled about Emma, William says. And then the next day, Clayton recorded that Joseph called me up into his private room with Emma and there stated an agreement they had mutually entered into. They both stated their feelings on many subjects and wept considerable. And then Clayton writes, Oh, may the Lord soften her heart that she may be willing to keep and abide by his holy law. So two days after this, it's official. Clayton recorded that he made a deed for half the steamboat called the Maid of Iowa from Joseph to Emma. And he also deeded to Emma over 60 city lots. So now Emma is going to have some financial security no matter what happens to Joseph and no matter what happens to their marriage. Mm -hmm. And so Joseph is giving some He is yielding to this part of the agreement to try to keep this marriage together, right? Whatever it would take. Yeah. And so, number one, Joseph's got to ask permission before he marries any other wife. Emma's got to approve. And number two, that Emma needs to have some self-sufficiency in the case of Joseph's death or the dissolution of their marriage so that she could be financially taken care of and take care of the children. Yeah. And again, that thread is picked up after Joseph's death. It seems like a lot of the break between Emma and Brigham Young and the Twelve is over property that could belong to the church but belong to Joseph, like the Joseph Smith translation, end up with Community of Christ, with the RLDS church, and not our church because Emma refuses to hand them over. There's just a real concern of hers, especially after his death, that am I going to be financially okay? Am I going to be able to take care of myself and my family? I don't think she's being selfish here. This is a totally understandable thing. For sure. But it's part of the the story of what's going on in this marriage. That's right. We should mention our source here is William Clayton, who was Joseph Smith's personal secretary at the time. He's very close to the situation. He draws up some of the papers, and we trust him here. Yeah.
there's also other people that talk about Emma's opposition, like Eliza R. Snow, who's very close to Emma, yeah. but is also married to Joseph Smith. You know, in most of her writing later on in her life, she signs her name Eliza R. Snow Smith. Yeah. What happens between Emma and Eliza? Yeah, so if Emma's kind of rebellious and infuriated and angry in July of 1843 when they come to this agreement after Hiram, bless his heart, tried to be peacemaker, then what happens at the end of that month and then in August and then in September is that Emma now starts to, still angry, but now she's going to start getting confrontational with Joseph's other wives. We have a count of at least three instances. So the first is Eliza R. Snow in July. Yeah, she's going to confront Eliza R. Snow. And we know that after their confrontation, Eliza is going to abruptly leave Nauvoo for a while to go live with her sister about 25 miles outside of Nauvoo. Yeah. Can I interject something there too, Scott? Yeah. The William McClellan letter where they talk about Fanny Alger also makes the accusation that Eliza was pregnant with Joseph's child and Emma pushed her down the stairs. Mm -hmm. Now, that is patently false. (laughs) Brian Hales and Locke Mackay went to the house they were living in, which is still there, and actually like took photographs, measured the stairs, and it was physically impossible for that to have occurred. That did not happen, and I don't want that slur to be on Emma Smith's name or on Eliza R. Snow. Eliza leaves the city. She goes and lives with her sister, but neither Eliza nor Emma ever bring that up. It's from this third-hand account that William McClellan, who wasn't even there, brings up. And so we need to take that story and just kind of stomp it out because it makes Emma look bad. It makes Eliza look bad. And it's frankly just not true. Mm -hmm. It's physically impossible based on the home that they were living in at the time. Well said. Sorry, I just wanted to add that in. No, that's good. Yeah, that's, let's stop out rumors as much as we can as we go through this. Yeah. There's also an account that in August, so the next month, Emma confronts another one of Joseph's wives named Flora Woodworth. Mm-hmm. And Emma demands that Flora give her back the gold watch that Joseph had given to her after they were sealed earlier in the spring of that year. According to one account, she does give it back, and then Emma stomps on it and breaks it. Flora's then going to marry another man like the next day. And we're not sure if that's because Emma told her to do something like that or if somehow she was angry or rebellious, but it's a non-member guy. She just marries him like the next day after Emma confronts her. We're not sure what to make of that. Mm -hmm. And that same month of August, William Clayton recorded that Emma had resisted the principle of plural marriage in toto, like totally resisting now, and that Joseph worried that she would obtain a divorce and leave him. You mentioned flash forward. Things are going to end okay. Things are going to end well between Joseph and Emma. At his death, they're going to be pregnant, and she is completely devastated by that loss. Mm -hmm. But before, there's a season, right? Things haven't gotten better yet. We're going to get there. But in August, things are maybe at their fever pitch. September, it continues in this way. Emma is going to expel the Partridge sisters from their home. Emily said that Emma wanted them to leave the city, which they didn't do. Emily also said that Emma wanted us to immediately divorce. She seemed to think that all she had to do was say the word and it would be done. But we thought different, Emily said. We looked upon the covenants we had made as sacred. But Emily goes on to say that Emma confronted Joseph so hard about this when Emily's in the room that Joseph said, fine. And he shook Emily's hand, and Emily understood that to be, you know, kind of the end of their marriage. At least that's what she says in one account. Mm -hmm. So Emma's now confronting the wives and trying to get them to move out of town and get out of the way. And she even, there was a young man that she told Eliza Partridge that she should let him uh, take her on a, on a little buggy ride, right? She's trying to play matchmaker with some of Joseph's wives. So July, August, September, that's when it's at its worst. But in October, things start to turn better. Things calm down. William Clayton records that on October 19th, Joseph began to tell me that Emma was turned quite friendly and kind. We're not sure what happened, but by October, she's calmed down as she actually begins working by Joseph's side, helping to administer temple ordinances like washing and anointings to the sisters of the church, and things seem to be on the up and up with them. Mm -hmm. There's only kind of one last thing that persists, and that is that as president of the Relief Society, Emma Smith continues to use her position to advocate against plural marriage, both privately and publicly. One instance I think is worth mentioning as far as publicly goes. There had been some efforts in February of 1844 to really slander a lot of the men and women of Nauvoo. Some people were accusing Joseph and other church leaders and some of the women in Nauvoo 
of being involved together in some sort of prostitution ring or something like that, or being involved in Bennett's spiritual wife system. Mm -hmm. Hiram Smith had been accused by a guy named Erasmus Bostwick, and he had been fined 50 bucks for slandering Hiram Smith and other women in the city. And this really provoked Emma, and she went to W.W. Phelps. It seems that it was Emma that did it, but W.W. Phelps is approached by somebody, and it appears to be Emma, Mm -hmm. to draft an epistle or like a resolution, which was edited by Emma after he drafted it. And after that, this epistle, which they're going to call the Voice of Innocence, she goes and holds four meetings of the Relief Society, two Saturdays in a row on the 9th and 16th of March, 1844. They read the voice of innocence and then ask the Relief Society sisters to adopt it, to try to stop the slandering that was going on in Nauvoo. Well, here's just an excerpt from the preamble. (laughs) Can I read this? Is this okay? This is pretty intense. Yeah. Here's what the preamble says. So written by W.W. Phelps, edited by Emma Smith, quote, Curse the man that preys upon female virtue. Curse the man that slanders a woman. Let the righteous indignation of insulted innocence and virtue spurn him from society. Let the dignity of the mothers of Israel kick the bloodthirsty pimp from the pale of social communion. Let the timid daughters of Nauvoo dread such canker worms more than the pestilence that walketh in darkness, and shun them as the serpent on the land and the shark in the sea. (laughs) My God, is there not female virtue and valor enough in this city to let such mean men die of the rot that the sexton, that's a grave digger, may carry their putrid bodies beyond the limits of the city for food, for vultures and eagles. <laughs> Whoa. That's just one quote from there. It's intense. That's intense language. Yeah. So Erasmus Boswick is kind of the one that seems to have spurred this on, but it seems that John C. Bennett and his copycats are out there still really just causing trouble yeah. in Nauvoo still. And one of the resolutions, though, catch this language. Wherefore, while the marriage bed undefiled is honorable, let polygamy bigamy, fornication, adultery, and prostitution be frowned out of the hearts of honest men to drop in the gulf of fallen nature, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched, and let all the saints say, Amen. Whoa. So after reading that, the women then took a vote on who would be willing to receive the principles of virtue and keep the commandments of God and uphold Emma Smith specifically in putting down iniquity. And the meeting minutes say it was received unanimously. And then Emma Smith said that her determination was to do her duty effectually in putting down transgression. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this is more broadly against sexual immorality and all the various perversions that are possible. But I think it's just interesting that on the list, she made sure to include polygamy, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's a kind of a public example. There are some private examples. John Taylor says that the Emma came to his wife, Leonora, and tried to talk her out of getting involved in plural marriage. Mm -hmm. Let me emphasize here, too, that the women that are entering into plural marriage don't see it as adultery or as shameful. No. For instance, Emily Partridge, after Emma told them that she wanted them to divorce Joseph, said, We thought differently. She writes, We looked upon the covenants we had made as sacred. And so there's definitely not only a big difference between Emma and Joseph, but between Emma and the other women who didn't see themselves as committing sin. They saw themselves as living a covenant commandment from God. That's right. Lots of tension going on. Lots of tension, yeah. We can wrap up this part of today's episode with maybe a summary from Brian Hells I thought was nice. Mm -hmm. We can't plug his books enough, can we? They're so good. This is from volume two, page 138. He summarizes kind of this whole period this way. He said, In the fall of 1843, Emma experienced a short-lived change of heart regarding plural marriage that with compromises on both sides evolved into an outwardly stable monogamous lifestyle for the couple in the months after their explosive confrontation in July 1843 over the revelation on celestial marriage. He continues, It appears that Emma's challenges in relation to plural marriage were unique among all of the polygamous wives in Nauvoo. And I love his point here. He says, Because the revelation came through her husband, she was distinctively positioned to second-guess some, if not all, of the motives behind it. Mm. Accordingly, her proximity to the revelation giver demanded greater faith than that required of any other wife in a plural marriage. Mm. The historical record indicates she continually strove to accept plural marriage despite her vacillations. Unquestioned is Emma's devotion to Joseph and his return devotion to her, despite the surrounding marital whirlwind to which they were exposed.
let's move to a different thread, which is how plural marriage is involved in the death of Joseph Smith. Now, this is one of several factors. In fact, one thing I would point out is the people that pull the trigger and actually kill Joseph Smith are motivated primarily by political reasons. You know, they're worried about the growing influence of the saints in the region. And there's not a lot of mysteries as to who the trigger men are. But the factors that lead up to Joseph Smith's death, John C. Bennett plays a role, but probably the person inside Nauvoo who's most singly responsible for Joseph Smith's martyrdom is William Law. That's right. And William Law's disaffection is also linked in some ways to plural marriage and some other stuff that was going on in William Law's life a little bit. So introduce us to William Law. Tell us a little bit about him and where he's coming from. Yeah, so William Law is Joseph's second counselor in the first presidency, and uh, he's mentioned in section 124, only very positively. There's a lot of blessings that are promised to William Law, if, there's a lot of if statements in those blessings, if he stays faithful. Mm -hmm. And he was just one of the biggest supporters and advocates of Joseph Smith as a prophet. But it seems the thing that starts to turn him is when Joseph tacitly starts to introduce the principle of plural marriage. Joseph wouldn't always say it overtly, but as he tacitly starts to kind of fill William Law out on this, William instantly just tries to stamp this down. He's reported as saying, quote, if an angel from heaven was to reveal to me that a man should have more than one wife, I would kill him. Whoa. (laughs) That's, That's how he felt about that. But ironically, in the fall of 1843, while meeting regularly with the endowed saints, in fact, the book Saints is super good about this. Let me quote from the book Saints a little bit. Hopefully listeners will forgive all my quoting today. This is in volume one. It says, while meeting regularly with the endowed saints, William Law hid from Joseph and Hiram the fact that he was guilty of adultery. And in committing the sin, William felt that he had transgressed against his own soul. Around this time, Hiram gave him a copy of the Revelation on Marriage, DNC 132. Take it home and read it, Hiram instructed. Then be careful with it and bring it back again. William studied the Revelation and showed it to his wife, Jane. He doubted its authenticity, but she was sure it was real. William took the revelation to Joseph, who confirmed that it was genuine. Then William begged him to renounce its teachings. But Joseph testified that the Lord had commanded him to teach plural marriage to the saints and that he would stand condemned if he disobeyed. So there's some interesting ironies happening right here, right? Mm -hmm. So he is adamant against plural marriage, yet at the same time he's got the sin of adultery, which he has not yet confessed which he's about to confess. He's going to confess that on his deathbed. He thought he was very sick, and he will confess to Hiram Smith his adultery later that same year. So this is 1843 in the fall. He admits to Hiram that he did not feel worthy to live or to die, he said. Now I'm quoting again from Saints. Yet he wanted to be sealed for eternity to Jane, and he asked Joseph if that were possible. Joseph took the question to the Lord, And the Lord revealed that William could not receive the ordinance because he was adulterous. Mm. At this point, William's heart began to burn with anger against Joseph. So in late December, he and Jane stop meeting with the endowed saints. Jane advises that they just sell their property and quietly leave Nauvoo. But William wanted to crush Joseph. So he began plotting secretly with others who opposed the prophet. And not long after, he lost his place in the first presidency. Yeah. And it's fair to say that William Law is not the trigger man. Nope. You know, he's not in the mob that attacks the jail. Right. But he's probably more responsible for Joseph Smith's death than any other person. Yeah. He just takes this and it eats him up. That's right. You pulled this quote. Joseph McMurrin heard it from William's son, Richard. So 1843, William Law, with his arms around the neck of the prophet, was pleading with him to withdraw the doctrine of plural marriage, which he at that time commenced to teach to some of the brethren. Mr. Law predicting that if Joseph would abandon the doctrine, Mormonism would in 50 or 100 years dominate the Christian world. Mr. Law pleaded for this with tears streaming from his eyes. The prophet was also in tears, but he informed the gentleman that he could not withdraw the doctrine, for God had commanded him to teach it, and condemnation would come upon him if he was not obedient to the commandment. Ugh, difficult stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, William Law takes it to an extreme so much so that it's fairly clear, you know, his end game is that Joseph be not just removed from his position, but killed. Yeah. So how does he go from being angry about plural marriage and not being able to be sealed to his wife because of his own adulterous past to actually leading to the death of Joseph? Do you want to connect any of those dots for us? 
Oh, there's the obvious ones. He's eventually excommunicated in the spring of 1844. Yeah. And when Joseph gives things like the King Follett sermon and he's making reference to apostates from the church, this is probably a reference to William Law and his brother, who's also complicit in this yeah. and participating. William and Wilson Law, the Law brothers, right? Right. At this time, they start the wheels in motion to try and figure it out. And I don't want to get too conspiratorial here, but it seems like there's a genuine conspiracy. Yeah. They wait until most of the 12 apostles are gone on missions. Yeah. Joseph Smith announces he's running for president of the United States in January of 1844. And the apostles, who are some of Joseph Smith's most loyal supporters, are all called on missions. Brigham Young later on said, if I'd been in Nauvoo, I never would have let Joseph go to Carthage. Mm. William is clearly like working with other people like Chancey Higby and Robert Foster to corner Joseph into a place where they can basically get him to a spot where they know that he'll be murdered. Yeah. Some accounts actually place William Law in Carthage when Joseph Smith arrives there, claiming that Joseph Smith is never going to leave Carthage jail alive. So this is where the expositor comes into play, right? That's right. The publishers of the Nauvoo Expositor are William and Wilson Law. And the expositor, which is published in the beginning of June 1844, makes two primary accusations against Joseph Smith. One is that he's teaching the plurality of gods and that this is blasphemous. And the other is that Joseph Smith is practicing plural marriage. So they make this public accusation, and Joseph and the city council feel like they have to make a response to it. Tell us a little bit about how one thing leads to another, leads to the death of Joseph Smith, Scott. Yeah, the Nauvoo Expositor seems to be a deliberate play. They had to be so inflammatory as to require some action by Joseph as mayor and the city council. And you know, with the accusations of false doctrine, damnable doctrines, they call it, and abominable whoredoms, as they talk about, and it's very incendiary. The way they talk about plural marriage in the Nauvoo Expositor, I don't recommend it as like pleasant reading, but if you ever want to check out what they said, it's just, it's really bad. It's pretty extreme. <laughs> very extreme, yeah. Luring young women from across the ocean to Nauvoo so that they can pounce and gratify their lust upon them. It's, it's so provocative and so incendiary that the city council's got to do something about this. They meet multiple times. What should we do about this press? They're going to consult legal texts and conclude from that. So the Nauvoo Charter, which ironically John C. Bennett helped to establish, right, mm -hmm. had a clause that public nuisances could be removed legally. And then they look at some legal texts which say that a libelous press, which the Nauvoo Expositor was, can be considered a public nuisance. So if you put two and two together, the libelous press could legally be destroyed as a public nuisance. Mm -hmm. They talked about if they don't do this, if they don't destroy the press, then the Missouri days are going to come back, right? This is so inflammatory, this kind of stuff. It's going to whip up everyone that's not LDS in the surrounding areas into such a frenzy as to bring them upon Nauvoo and blood would certainly be shed. So they're trying to avoid that. But in agreeing to destroy the press, that's going to give legal recourse to William Law yeah. and those that were with him to charge him with riot. They get charged with riot, and both Joseph and the entire city council is required to go and respond to these charges at Carthage. They had to go to Carthage. Yeah. And so that seems to be all part of the trap, right? Yeah. Uh, we'll probably do a series just on the martyrdom of Joseph Smith, and yeah. we can dive into this deeper. But I want to point out a couple of things. Yeah. The city council meets together to make the decision to destroy the Exposter Press. Right. They publish the minutes of that meeting later on. They're there for everybody to read. There are people arguing in favor of the destruction of the press, including Joseph Smith. John Taylor is probably the one that argues most forcefully for it. But the question of were their actions legal? Mm -hmm. A young law professor named Dallin H. Oaks mm -hmm. actually wrote an article in the 1960s where he looked at the laws of the time and the precedent of the time. And his conclusion was that the destruction of the expositor was legal. Yeah. You know, like you said, they consult law texts. They have discussions back and forth. And ultimately, somebody in the meeting speaks about Hans Mill and says, you know what, if this newspaper is allowed to print, it's printing stuff that is just going to stir up problems. There's going to be another Hans Mill that happens here. 
So the destruction of the Expositor Press is not a riot. It's not a mob. They go and serve a warrant, and then a posse organized by the sheriff systematically destroys the press. Yeah. And the other thing is, is Joseph Smith is willing to go to trial over the legality of this action. He actually appears before two judges in Nauvoo. One's a Latter-day Saint, one isn't, and is exonerated both times. Yeah. But at this point, the laws and the, who are in Nauvoo and the people outside Nauvoo, like Tom Sharp, that really want Joseph dead just have their excuse yes. to yell and scream and holler until they can get Joseph out of Nauvoo and into a place where he's vulnerable, which is Carthage jail. Yeah, so I guess in summary then we would say that if it wasn't for William Law, we wouldn't have the Nauvoo Expositor. And if it wasn't for the Nauvoo Expositor, we wouldn't have the means to get Joseph arrested, we wouldn't have the means to get him to Carthage, we wouldn't have something to accuse him about. Yeah. And so it does seem like those dominoes connect, right? William Law's reaction to plural marriage, his anger toward Joseph, his now association with those who are conspirators against Joseph's life, their plot with the Nabu expositor leading to his arrest, leading to his death. Yeah. It reminds me, Joseph said, according to Brigham Young, speaking of plural marriage, he said, I will die for it. I will die for it. Mm. Joseph had a sense that if he stuck to this principle, that it would lead to his death. Yeah. And in that, he turned out to be prophetic. Yeah. And like I said, we're simplifying for the sake of our subject here. Yeah. There's a number of reasons why that militia unit attacks Carthage jail. That's right. I don't think plural marriage was the first in the minds of the men that attacked the jail, to be honest with you. But no. for the men inside Nauvoo, and it's really an inside job and an outside job that comes together, yeah. it seems like that was at the forefront of their reasoning. Let's try and process here for a minute, Scott. Yeah. Going away from all this, what are some takeaways that you would have now that we've kind of explored Joseph Smith's plural marriage practice from beginning to end? It's just a hard topic. <laughs> it's just a hard topic to study. You empathize with Joseph. He's between a rock and a hard place in terms of introducing a principle that comes from God, an angel urging him multiple times, sometimes threatening him to get this started. I've said this in previous episodes. My reading of it is he's a reluctant polygamist who is willing to obey God at all costs. It is going to lead to some serious strain in his own relationships with Oliver Cowdery to some degree, with his wife, Emma, as we've explored, yeah. and with his own second counselor in the first presidency. Many of the insiders in Nauvoo who turn against Joseph had been former members of the church, and they cite primarily plural marriage as the thing that kind of did it for him, the thing that pushed him over the edge, right? Mm -hmm. the members of the high council like Austin Cowles and others that maybe we'll explore later when we talk about the martyrdom. But it's kind of a, it's a group of folks that are so dissatisfied with Joseph introducing this that they're willing to call him a fallen prophet. They're willing to start their own church. They set William Law up as its head. This causes such conflict for Joseph that I can't see it other than Joseph doggedly determined to fulfill God's will. Mm -hmm. You know, from one perspective, if Joseph Smith just wanted to have an outlet to fulfill his lustful desires, as some people accuse him of, like there's a lot easier ways he could have gone about that, right? Mm -hmm. So the sincerity of his actions and the stuff he was willing to go through tell me and indicate to me that he's authentically acting on what he fully understands to be a revelation. So my assessment, just looking at all the evidence, is that he was a disciple of Jesus Christ seeking to do his will, and that's going to lead to a, a premature death. Mm -hmm. What about you? I've been thinking of this statement Eliza Snow makes. As you know, Eliza Snow is one of Joseph's plural wives, and I think in our discussions we've tried really hard to involve the voice of women. Yeah. So this isn't just men talking about plural marriage. We're talking about women who, like Eliza, ran the risk of being accused of being adulterous. Yeah. She writes this. She said, he, this is Joseph, he knew the voice of God. He knew the commandment of the Almighty to him was to go forward, to set the example and establish celestial plural marriage. He knew that he had not only his own prejudices and prepossessions to combat and to overcome, but those of the whole Christian world stared him in the face. But God, who was above all, had given the commandment and he must be obeyed. Yet the prophet hesitated and deferred from time to time until an angel of God stood by him with a drawn sword and told him that unless he moved forward and established plural marriage, 
his priesthood would be taken from him and he would be destroyed. This testimony he not only bore to my brother, that's Lorenzo Stone, but also to others, a testimony that cannot be gainsaid. So on the one hand, was he perfect? We've kind of documented that it was difficult for him to implement and he wasn't always sure what he was doing. And obviously he made mistakes along the way. Was he sincere is the big question Mm -hmm. that exists in my mind. And from his testimony, from the testimony of people like Eliza Snow and Lucy Walker and William Clayton, and the list goes on and on, it appears that he was sincerely acting on what he saw as a revelation from God. I can't think of very many people that have had a more difficult burden laid on them, but that he stayed true to even at the cost of his own life. Yeah. I think the average Latter-day Saint will spend their whole life wrestling with this stuff. But that is okay, you know? Mm. It's worth the wrestle to ask yourself, discipleship, what does it mean? And what does it mean when Joseph Smith said a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things can never produce the kind of faith necessary into life and salvation? It might not just be sacrificing our money or our time. It could be sacrificing like our social perceptions or our comfort in larger society. This was a huge sacrifice, and I'm grateful that they made it. First of all, grateful because my wife is a descendant of some of these people that practice plural marriage. It's pretty personal, yes. It's pretty personal. But that I also, from reading the historical record, think that this demonstrates absolute sincerity in Joseph Smith's belief that he was acting on the commandments of God, acting on revelations he was given. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Scott, anything else you want to add to our discussion here? No, if you guys have made it this far with us, thank you so much for listening. This is sometimes heavy stuff, but we find it's both interesting and important. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, and check in at Doctrine and Covenants Central for more resources on this subject. We publish things all the time, and we're more than happy to help you with questions too. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you for listening to this episode of Church History Matters. Next week, we continue this series by exploring the history of the spread of plural marriage in the church after Joseph Smith's death, as well as the detailed history of how it came to an end under the crushing pressure of the United States government. We'll talk about the George Reynolds trial, the manifesto, the Reed Smoot trials and the second manifesto, the resignation of two members of the Quorum of the Twelve over this, the beginning of the FLDS church, and more. Today's episode was produced by Scott Woodward and edited by Nick Galetti and Scott Woodward, with show notes and transcript by Gabe Davis. Church History Matters is a podcast of Scripture Central, a nonprofit which exists to help build enduring faith in Jesus Christ by making Latter-day Saints scripture and church history accessible, comprehensible, and defensible to people everywhere. For more resources to enhance your gospel study, go to scripturecentral.org, where everything is available for free because of the generous donations of people like you. Thank you so much for being a part of this with us.